Good morning. Welcome to another session of Raising the Bar, hosted by Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh Foundation. I'm Rachel Petroselli, president of the foundation, and we're excited to focus on the Whole Child Wellness Clinic. This clinic is a pilot clinic that was conceived by clinicians at both UPMC Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh and UPMC Behavioral Health. It's designed to provide services for children who have developmental and behavioral health needs. And like most medical homes, it's a coordinated hub of care for children and families. For many of you, you might understand there are barriers and frustrations that come with trying to seek help for your child if they're experiencing behavioral health issues. I'm a parent of a child that knows that all too well, and I'm so proud of what our clinic, the Whole Child Wellness Clinic, is able to accomplish in support of these families. And it's all funded by philanthropy. It would only happen, it only happens because of philanthropy. We're going to introduce the, the program in just a minute, but first a few reminders that your mic has been muted and we are excited to allow some time at the end of our program to answer questions, so please use the chat function at the bottom of your screen. We're recording the video, we're recording this program. It will be available with a link emailed to you in a few days, and we invite you to share it with family and friends who might find this of interest and certainly if you've had to cut out early and aren't able to watch it to the end, you'll have a chance to catch up and see how we conclude. And finally, as you can see at the beginning, we're seated here together, but we are socially distant. Our masks are close by and we are taking precautions to prevent the spread of COVID-19. So now to introduce our great team here who leads our whole child wellness clinic. Just, Dr. Justin Schreiber is our medical director, assistant professor of psychiatry and pediatrics. Dr. Chelsea Grief is our psychologist. Abby Meisels is our nurse coordinator. And Nafise Wynn is our family support partner. It's the way these individuals work together in addressing the needs of children and their families that's super special. And we're excited to share that um, and how the team works and, and the impact it has through a video we've prepared. So we'll turn our attention to that video and come back with a brief slideshow program that each of our presenters will walk us through. And again, we will have time for questions at the end. So the Whole Child Wellness Clinic is an integrated home for kids that oftentimes had difficulty finding really that great fit. So kids that have struggled with behavioral health, developmental, physical health conditions, and oftentimes we find that they don't have a great landing spot. And so a place where they can get all of those services integrated with primary care, psychiatry, psychology, and integrated evaluation, and then immediately getting into treatment. So we can ensure that their both home environment, school environment, their behavioral health, their developmental health, and physical health are all taken care of together in one location. The collaborative care model for the Whole Child Wellness Clinic is really interesting, I think. You have um, primary care, which will be serviced by one of our doctors. You have the psychiatric care, which is medication management for behavioral health needs, which will be served by a psychiatrist. The psychological needs will be served by um, our psychologists, and their specialty is looking at the behaviors and kind of looking for trends and figuring out how to manage those behaviors um, without medication. My role as a nurse coordinator is really awesome. I get the opportunity to meet families, make great connections with them, and through making great meaningful connections with them, I'm able to help them identify their strengths as a family and maybe some barriers that they have that prevent their child from reaching their ultimate goals. By building this type of relationship and being able to be transparent about the vision that's shared by the team for their child, we're able to get their kid in a spot where they can get all the services they need along with all the care that they get in one place and we can help not only in the clinic, but also out in the community, whether it be at home or at school.
So once a family is referred and accepted to our clinic, they typically receive a call either from our nurse coordinator or our family support partner to introduce them to the clinic, provide a brief overview of who we are and what we do, um, and then to assess any uh, engagement barriers. Our initial appointments are three hours at length, so this allows us to be as comprehensive as we can to fully understand a child's physical and behavioral health. Uh, when the family arrives at the clinic, they're greeted by one of our team members in the waiting room. Uh, first, the family completes their uh, physical health assessment with our pediatrician and nurse coordinator, while um, myself and our family support partner look at some of the other data and rating scales that we have. Following their physical health evaluation, the family meets with uh, myself as a psychologist and our pediatrician psychiatrist uh, to do a clinical interview with the family together to gain a better understanding of why the family's here, what's their understanding of why they're here, what their concerns are, and what their goals are. The family support partner is an individual who has the lived experience or is living the experience of the families they're working with. A typical day for me, I come in, um, check phone calls, and then we look online to see first patient. We go over the patient, what our plans are for that appointment. Um, the doctor will ask whatever questions he has, and then it's my turn to sit with the parent and just kind of chit chat about what's been going on. That's when they let their hair down and let me know their struggles and their challenges of the week. I let them know that, again, they're not alone. I'm living it, I understand. And so we just kind of talk it out. I let them know that if there's anything they ever need to call me, any resource, I will help them. I'd say it started March 8th, 2013, when we were being discharged home. I got the news that he needed to have surgery. His first surgery was at seven months. Over time in childcare, he was doing great. And then at two, something changed. Like I, I noticed he wasn't like the other children. And in childcare, you're not supposed to compare children. However, you notice something's wrong. He got his first diagnosis at the age of three with ADHD and ODD. He had seven therapists at one time between OT, a TSS, a BSC, coming to the home and coming to childcare. Eventually he was kicked out of that child care center because they just could not handle his behaviors. Eventually I had to quit my job because no one would take him without him having a therapist first. And by that time we were done with therapists because the child care center he went to had them in there. Um, he started kindergarten and the first question I asked in our IEP meeting was when it's time for him to get kicked out because of his behaviors. How much time do I have before finding another facility for him to go to? And they promised me that we that's their last resort. They are going to work with him before that even happens. And luckily he flourished in kindergarten. Um, by first grade, he made honor roll. He was excited. My baby is now in second grade. And so I'm proud of him. Through generous gift giving by the foundation, my position can exist. Um, I wear many, many hats. I'm nurse coordinator, but more than that, I'm the clinic nurse, I'm the medical assistant, I'm the person that rooms the patients. In the future, with more funding from generous donors, from the foundation, we'll be able to not only um, expand the roles that I perform, but also hire on other people like physical therapy, occupational therapy, social workers. We'll be able to give complete care to these kiddos once we have more funding. So the Whole Child Wellness Clinic requires philanthropy to be able to run because the way that insurance currently is established, you can't have multiple providers see someone on the same day, um, especially if it's for a combination of behavioral health, developmental together, because oftentimes those get grouped. But to have everything together in almost like a one-stop shop of location and a location where people know really well and feel comfortable with um, really helps to reduce stigma and makes it a place where we know that we can give the best services possible for these kids. Welcome back. Now we're going to turn it over to our team here to talk through some of the updates about the program since its inception of first seeing patients about a year ago. A lot has been accomplished. They have many exciting success stories to share. And so I will turn it over to Dr. Schreiber to kick us off. 
Thanks a lot. I'm really excited to talk about where we've come and where we're planning to keep going with this clinic. You know, what you can see from the timeline is that, sure, we started in November, but it's been years of really working with of effort from many people to get us up and going, and really with a lot of philanthropic support to have that happen. And now we see with some of the work that you're gonna hear about that we're ready to keep moving, we're ready to bring in more families, and we're ready to really expand from the 28 we have to 50 and then up to 250 with even more staff. Um, and also we don't see in that timeline is that we really went through through the difficulties of COVID and, and made it through that with a lot of families still involved and still running as a clinic with all that support that we've gotten. But I think what's most important is to really hear kind of what's actually happening. So I'm gonna have Nafisa talk a little bit about some of our families and the work that we've been doing with them. Um, one patient we have um, prior to the clinic, he's an 11 year old with severe asthma and um, he was suspended from school for fighting, aggression, anger. Mom noticed he was emotional at times, sad at times, to the point where he wrote down suicidal thoughts, but never followed through. Um, he had missed multiple appointments when he was younger. The family just, in, I guess, disarray a little bit um, until they were able to get it together. And um, he had been referred to four different behavioral health services, CCF, CDU, TIPS, whole child. Um, the family was discharged from CCF for not reaching or for not paying attention to the attempts that were made to make appointments. And so they just kind of fell off a little bit. And um, Chelsea will be able to talk about the snapshots of the clinic. So during the past year, our team has evaluated uh, 38 families in total. And currently we have 28 uh, patients and families enrolled in our whole child wellness clinic. The remaining 10 families have either graduated from care or were referred to other services to better meet the, the needs of the family and the child. Additionally, um, Abby and Nafisa have made over 400 calls um, to, or excuse me, 400 referrals uh, to, uh, com for community resources, uh, including resources for food to local food banks, um, other community agencies, uh, including resources for parental mental health, educational advocacy, uh, as well as um, Habitat for Humanity to help one family uh, get a wheelchair ramp uh, built into their home. Uh, additionally, our team has made close to 2,000 calls in the past year. Uh, these calls are documented back and forth to our families. They also include calls to school, as well as other agencies that are involved in our patients' lives. Additionally, one of the primary goals of our clinic is to provide um, diagnostic clarity for our patients and families when they come to whole child. Uh, we see a number of uh, children and preteens with complex uh, behavioral and physical health diagnoses, and we wanted to provide clarity and educate the family to better understand um, why their child is acting a certain way and what is happening emotionally. During this past year, what we've seen is that 70% of our patients, um, we have been able to clarify or change their diagnoses. Um, and we do that by a thorough diagnostic assessment, which is co compromised of multiple uh, different parts. In addition to, co to collecting lots of background information, uh, looking at a child's developmental history, family background, um, as well as our clinical interviews by myself and Dr. Schreiber, we also utilize uh, rating scales completed by the parents or caregivers, teachers, and children themselves, as well as a cognitive assessment completed between myself and the child, looking at their attention and executive functioning skills, um, episodic memory, verbal memory, as well as uh, language skills and processing speed. What we've seen, especially with our current population, is the high prevalence of trauma that our patients and families have experienced. Uh, most specifically, many of our patients have experienced um, abuse, neglect, and have witnessed domestic and community violence at home. Uh, what we that looks like for some of our children is they can be uh, very emotionally dysregulated, can be very reactive, um, have difficulty sleeping, have difficulty trusting adults. Um, and as a trauma trained clinician, it is helpful for myself and Dr. Schreiber to educate the family on what is trauma and what are PTSD and trauma symptoms 
look like in their child. Uh, and being able to, to put a name and say, you know, this looks like hypervigilance and intrusion with their nightmares and give the uh, families a better understanding of why their child may be acting a certain way. We want the families to really understand what the diagnosis is so we can collaborate with them to develop a comprehensive treatment plan. I'd like to turn over to Abby to talk a little bit more about our families. All right, let me tell you about our families. Um, a lot of our families are led by single parents that have some sort of financial struggle. So we knew that um, once COVID came, there might be a lot of special needs that our families have. So we took a universal, universal, excuse me, approach to um, food resources and um, preparation for the 2020-21 school year. Um, in preparation for the 2020-21 school year, we were extremely comfortable doing so because um, throughout our time with Whole Child Wellness Clinic, we've been active in IEP meetings. We've also had Chelsea, who has done a phenomenal job of connecting with the schools and making sure that our patients' behavioral plans are not only followed at home, but also in the school setting. Um, we also prepared our families by getting them a bundle of information when they returned to school. So we were we reviewed their families, um, school districts, school plan for reopening. We gave them resources about um, educational resources, um, parent groups, uh, school advocates, and then we also connected them with uh, education rights so they know what type of education their child should expect to get when they return for the 2020-21 school year. And I'll turn it back to Nafisa. And to follow up with the patient I talked about earlier, now being in whole child, um, his asthma has been under control. When he comes for his appointments, he's checked um, in the beginning just to make sure he's breathing nice and you don't hear anything going on because then they will take care of it uh, before we start the appointment. They made every appointment <laughs> since starting the clinic. Uh, mom is very thankful um, with his progress. She said that a teacher has reached out and let her know that they see the progress in him in school. Um, and also mom is just, she loves the clinic. She loves where he has come and where he's going. And Justin will be able to talk about what we're gonna do next. She said, thank you for sharing that great case example and for all of your hard work and these wonderful accomplishments. Um, Many children who've been able to participate in the program so far have certainly had the benefit of your collective attention, your problem solving, and the bridge that you span from the clinic to the community, which is so helpful. Parents, it, it can be frustrating to figure out what a child needs, to recognize they need help, and then to confront a, a system of complex resources and services that require multiple stops, delay time to get a good diagnosis and the right diagnosis, and then to get the treatment plan mm -hmm. in place. Um, what a, I mean, just what a huge difference it means in shortcutting a lot of the stumbling blo blocks and overcoming those barriers when you can assemble a team with the, the, the different um, expertise and, and focused responsibilities you have in meeting that child and that family's needs. So, Justin, what's next? How are we taking this clinic forward? So, you know, I think you've heard here that, that we've seen really great experiences for the families we're working with. And it's more than just the numbers, it's the individual families and childs that have had these experiences and really more deserve that opportunity. And so we really want to see this expansion happen from our original prototype of 50 patients to, break, to really expanding it up to 250 with a pilot. And as we do that, we also really want to be cognizant of what we're learning as we're going. We've learned a lot about the needs of some of the families we're working with and the fact that there is more support needed for that help in school, for therapeutic supports, and also things like speech and language supports. So due to that, we hope to continue to expand our staff um, expand to clinics that we're at working with CCP offices, Allegheny Health Network offices, and really ensure that we have a great service that we are learning from, expanding, improving, um, and really most importantly helping families out. Terrific. 
Well, we have a number of questions to get to um, and to build on our dialogue here. Just a reminder to our audience to please use the chat function at the bottom of your screen. We want to hear your questions, and we have time to answer them. And this team is well prepared to uh, give you um, as, as much information about this program. They're so proud of it. So um, why don't we begin with a question directed to you, Justin. In your words, can you describe why you think the clinic is so necessary? Yeah, I mean, I, I really reflect back on, on maybe talking about a patient experience that kind of highlights the importance of this clinic. Uh, we had someone who came in with their family and they needed um, their well child check, so their kind of annual evaluation. Uh, they needed immunizations. They needed to get blood work done due to some physiological problems that we had noticed. Um, they were going to need to get a behavioral health evaluation, which was going to include both the therapeutic end and also seeing a, seeing a psychiatrist to determine about medication management. There was assistance needed within school to determine about an IEP and working through that IEP. We're talking about six or seven places that they normally would have had to go to get all that done. And what we were able to do was really get that all done in one evaluation. Um, have it in one day instead of having to transport from place to place to place. Mm -hmm. And also at the same time to only have to really tell that story once instead of having to re go through it over and over and over to finally hopefully get the support they needed. So really starting from day one on we're here to help, we're here to provide support, really move towards treatment and getting things better. Well, as a parent, I certainly can relate to the, the reduced amount of time and uh, stops to make and all of those benefits, but how about for the child to, to um, help them feel comfortable in navigating any of these experiences? How do you think it improves their, um, their compliance in those sessions when it's just one place they have to get familiar with? Yeah, I mean, we know developmentally, and we work with, with a younger age, that 3 to 12 age range, just because that's where oftentimes the biggest need for services end up being. But that's a really hard developmental age to meet new people, talk through um, you know, their stories and their experiences. Oftentimes, it can really require just that individual experience to, to really be able to open up. And so the more and more they're having to go through a story, especially when there's trauma involved, can be re-traumatizing. And so we know that their comfort with coming back, their comfort with, can, with really building rapport is going to happen by being able to do that once, kind of get everyone together. Um, and, I, and we're seeing that response. We're seeing a lot of these kids that just open up quickly, that they say that they, they want to be there, they're enjoying that experience, which um, you know, I think is, is really important and it means a lot for us. That's great. So we have another question, and I'm going to direct it to Chelsea and Justin. What obstacles have you faced um, as you've gotten the clinic up and running and started to enroll our, our patients? What obstacles have you faced and how have you overcome them? So I'd say uh, one of our major obstacles this year, um, unsurprisingly, has been COVID-19. Uh, I feel like our uh, clinic team was able to adapt and pivot very quickly um, to prevent lapses in care for our patients and their families. We were able to um, transition quickly from in-person visits to telehealth visits by being open and flexible and using a variety of teleplatforms, uh, including VidYO, DoxyMe, Google Voice, FaceTime and, and simply phone calls. Uh, we were in contact with our families on a regular basis, um, especially Nafisa and Abby were um, communicating, communicating with families weekly um, and we avoided our patients um, having a lapse in their care. Anything to add, Justin? I think also one of the things right now is we've identified that for some families, they also want to be able to be back in person. That's the best way that they can really be able to, um, to tell their story, to get services and get support. And so we've been able to really do that as safe as possible to bring everyone back and use our resources the best we can and adapt in that way to say we're going to have a safe place for you to come mm -hmm. um, and still if that works best for you, then we're here to be able to do that. It's so important to make sure that they don't let their concerns about safety be a barrier to getting the care that's needed. Nafisa, if I can direct the next question to you, you've had this um, incredible lived experience in your own son's journey. And now that you're in a, a role that can really help to advocate for what families are going through and be at the table to talk with the clinicians and bring the voice um, to the table so that ev their needs, their concerns beyond just what's, um, you know, sort of the basics of the clinical uh, discussion can be heard. How do you feel that that's making a difference? And, and 
What are you most proud of? Um, I feel like me being a mom who is, has gone and is going through what they're going through right now, um, I understand how they feel. There are moms who are kind of hesitant sometimes on wanting to speak up and I let them know it's okay. One mom wanted to change medications and she's like, well, I heard of this one. And I'm like, well, my son's on it. So go ahead, you know, let him be known that that's what you want to do. And it may work, it may, it may not, but at least you are able to say, this is what I want and you will be heard. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'll have to check in and see how that's going with her. Um, it's, I like this role, it's important. I like being able to sit down and ask the parents, how do you feel mm -hmm. and what's going on? And then we're able to talk through it. Mm -hmm. Well, again, having my lived experience, the opportunity to, be a, to have you as a sounding board, just to know, am I doing the right thing? Is this the right path? Are these the right questions to, answer, to ask? And what should I expect? I, I just personally, um, you know, appreciate how meaningful that would have been in our experience and so excited that that is available to the families that are going through the whole child wellness clinic. So wonderful work that you're doing. Abby and Nafisa, so are you hearing whether or not uh, parents are satisfied? I mean, I'm, I'm projecting what I would be satisfied with, but how about the families that are going through this? What kind of feedback are you getting from them and do you think that we're meeting their needs? I mean, family satisfaction is very important to us and we are very early in our clinic so we know that we need feedback. Um, we've been surveying our families after their joint appointments with us and saying like, you know, what's working for you? How are things going? And how the surveys are set up, we're finding that they really love the team approach that our team takes to their child's care and that they see that they're a part of the team and that we value their decisions that they want to make as parents as well. Um, another thing that we're seeing is that our families um, are very satisfied. They're very, very happy. I know that's like redundant, but like they'll say um, that we help them become a more confident parent. They also, I allow them to fill out a rating scale from zero to 10 on how they think our clinic is in comparison to other clinics. And right now, I checked it yesterday, we are, um, they rate us 9.6 out of 10. So I think that's really impressive. It is impressive and something to be very proud of. Um, so I'll ask also for the for, for you, Abby, mm -hmm. what have you been surprised to learn over the last year? Mm -hmm. um, my background is pediatric intensive care, which a lot of people don't understand how you go from pediatric intensive care to behavioral health. But a lot of the patients that I saw in the ICU were children with behavioral health needs. I saw the kids with ADHD, uh, autism, um, expressive disorders being intubated. So a lot of, I feel like my families are the same mm -hmm. from intensive care to here. I just see them in a different arena. Mm -hmm. I get to learn what their home needs are um, and learning how a clinic like this can help a family. I learned how how different it is to go from a team of like 20 people every day to a team of four people every day is really different as well. There's a lot, I mean, there's a lot of communication, there's a lot that can be done. And I'm just so thrilled that, you know, the foundation's been able to support us, our small team, and I look forward to see um, what team members we add on and, you know, all the things we can do. That's wonderful. I'm gonna actually build on that question and um, maybe open it to Justin and Chelsea. When you think about um, how behavioral health services are typically delivered um, with individual stops of certain assessments and certain um, consultations and then um, you know that matrix of, of the journey that we described earlier for parents and families. As clinicians, what are the benefits you gain from the collective input from the team about a case, about a child, and about the family that you can immediately recognize is missing from the traditional way of navigating care. So one other thing that, that always um, I find extremely helpful is we will do a pre-meeting before we're gonna go to see the family for the initial evaluation and for follow-ups. And then afterwards, we discuss all together. 
And it's really important because part of that is also a time where we'll split. So what we might spend a little time where I might be with the family and Nafisa's with the family and, um, and then Chelsea might be more with the kid themselves and, and communicating with them. So we really can bring all that together, whereas maybe in a, a typical visit, I wouldn't have gotten all those pieces together. I wouldn't have had a family support partner who can say, like, let's talk about what that experience is like and really bring that in. So having that, that time at the end to talk all together is so important to really say, you know, well, maybe this is what's going on diagnostically. This is where we, what we need to do to help this family the most that otherwise we might have missed and had been kind of going a different route the whole time and not been as helpful for that family. Mm -hmm. Chelsea, anything from you? And, and to add on that, I think, you know, all of us, um, you know, come to this team with different experience and a different perspective um, that each of us as team members um, value highly. I think the four of us have a strong mutual respect from each other and we're very collaborative in our work together. And I think that allows us to bring together lots of different perspective and information uh, very quickly, not only in our initial evaluations, but also in our follow-up visits um, to allow, um, to communicate what the best plan forward and treatment plan is and how we best continue to collaborate with our families in treatment, uh, but also want to, are able to communicate our families' needs and concerns um, in between appointments as well. So the, the four of us, um, we enjoy working together um, and, you know, the work can be really challenging and hard and we also um, support each other, I think, very well uh, throughout each week. Thanks for sharing. And having spent a little time with this group, I assure our audience that they do have a great bit of fun working together while they're doing the very serious work of, um, of supporting our patients and families. And, um, and I wish that you had the opportunity to get to know them in person if we were able to do this uh, in more typical times. But I'm glad that we're here at least able to share the story of this, this great clinic. Just another, another question. Um, you've been very successful and are on track with the pilot. So when the, if you could just maybe remind our audience sort of the pilot phased timeline and then what happens at the conclusion of the pilot. So the pilot will, will plan and that's what really expand to um, bring in more staff, expand to other clinics, expand to um, our, the amount of families that we're bringing in and that's we're expecting around some time of July-ish. Uh, and as and then that will last until the end of 2022. Mm -hmm. um, and the plan throughout this whole time, and we're already in this these talks, is to also give this feedback. Evaluate again as we're evaluating this. Take that back to insurers to say this is really beneficial for families. Families want this. Um, families really want to have a family support person they can work with. They want care coordination. They want to be able to do everything together in one place without having to tell their story multiple times. So how do we make this happen? How do we fund this? And uh, I'm, you know, I'm glad to see that we already have these connections happening. We have a great advisory board that's providing some support. And we have, um, we've been in communication with the big health plans here about making this go from uh, that pilot phase into something even larger. It's fantastic. Well, <clears throat> the great thing about a program that's funded by philanthropy, we're doing it because we know that it's the right thing to do for kids and families, right? So we just overcome some of those financial hurdles that, um, you know, prevent this, the, the collaborative models from um, setting up and realizing there's another way to deliver care. But you still have to sustain it in the future and back to sustainability can also come from the insurance providers um, knowing that a lot of what you're also uh, gathering is not just the great stories and the anecdotal stories but the data and to show insurance companies that there are downstream benefits when you're able to provide a diagnosis more quickly when you're able to put children on the right path and help them overcome some of these barrier, barriers or reduce the breaks in their care um, process. What else might, might the insurance companies, meaning the business side of this model, um, what else might matter? You know, I think in the end of the day also, the sustainability is really important for, um, for cost. And, so, I th and one of the, so one of the things we're always looking at is how are we having an impact to 
ensure long-term decrease in costs. And you know, I think for us as clinicians, we're always thinking, first of all, what's most important for our families. We want them to be healthy. We want them to be successful, but also recognizing that that is a number one priority that um, the insurers look at as well. And so knowing that we can see that for a lot of these kids that if not getting appropriate services early, they instead might be going to higher levels of care, requiring um, higher expenses through those that's, uh, that also beyond the expenses is a difficult situation for that family, makes it even harder. So our goal is that we get to that point where we're not requiring the, the same um, higher levels of care that cost more, and so make it even a more affordable option for the insurers as well. That's great. So I have another question, um, and I'll uh, ask it to whomever would like to answer first. What's the biggest challenge you face on a day-to-day -day basis? Nafisa, I'm going to actually put you on the spot <laughs> I was, with you. I actually was going to volunteer first. <laughs> <laughs> um, a challenge for me, I would say daily, um, sometimes getting a hold of parents, that we have the ones that have a bit more responsibility on their plate, so they're a little harder to get in contact with. That just gives me the drive to kind of not so much stalk them, but be a little bit more persistent just to make sure they're doing all right. Um, and eventually they do reach out. I do to give them time to get back to me. But um, for me, that's a challenge. Abby, you look like you're ready. I'm ready. <laughs> um, I would say with, you know, post-COVID, we're, it's a different, you know, world entirely. So we're kind of finding that resources that were easy to get into are now a little bit more difficult for our families to access. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of problem solving with them and then also problem solving with the, the subspecialties if they're willing to work with us. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's kind of matching the great need our families have with what's available is kind of difficult mm -hmm. sometimes, but you know, we try. Okay. Chelsea, Justin, anything to add? You know, I think that um, also with with recognition of, of COVID, uh, um, just kind of being able to help our providers to, to know that we're still there and available. Um, you know, I think that a lot of people have this assumption that there wasn't, the behavioral health all of a sudden just disappeared and that there weren't these kinds of services there. And so I think we did a lot of work to ensure that um, we could have referrals continue to come in and kind of connect in that way. And I think that's something on a day-to-day -day is just continue to make sure um, that we're new, that people know we're there, and really can showing that we can be there and support and grow. Mm -hmm. And I think um, to add to what my team has said, uh, some challenges of making sure that we're able to connect with um, all of the other systems involved in our patients' lives. So um, certainly their school, uh, first and foremost, but some of our patients are also involved with CYF or other um, family court related agencies and wanting to make sure that we are able to connect with everyone in their lives to really um, approach our, our patients and their care in, in a sense of a, a multi-systemic approach. Um, certainly sometimes getting a hold of people uh, and having that time to really have um, an open and honest dialogue about how we as a greater team outside of whole child support that family um, can be challenging. That's great. Well, knowing that UPMC Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh is a top-ranked children's hospital. And we also have UPMC Behavioral Health as another top-ranked psychiatric health and research program here. Does this type of clinic, to your knowledge, exist anywhere else? And is it because we have the assets of these phenomenal institutions and the people that uh, come with those institutions? Is that um, why this kind of clinic is possible, or could it happen anywhere um, once we prove its success? So I think one thing I'll say is I, um, I'm from Southern California, and people always say, why aren't you going back where it's warm? Um, and I, my response is that this is one of the few places where we have the kind of opportunities to provide innovative care um, in a way that is that has so much support that you can't otherwise meet um, almost anywhere else. And so I think to start something like this, really requires that, to have really strong collaborations between both the physical and the behavioral health end, um, and both in ways where they're well known and well respected. Mm -hmm. The, there are models that exist that um, look in the physical health world. So for complex physical health, they're really trying to bring everything together. And, and we've seen really good success in some of those. Our complex care model that exists with the children's itself shows that. Mm -hmm. um, there are some models that 
that use the kind of collaborative cr approach for um, both the psychology and psychiatry model, um, bringing them together to have uh, both the therapy and um, psychiatry management in the same day. Those ones have also required oftentimes to, to have other supports, philanthropic support or grant support to run as they oftentimes weren't covered by insurance. So we did see some of that. What we don't generally see is the really collaborative physical and behavioral health happening together in a single visit with not having, not having to have necessarily tons of different people in the room, but a few people who can really do that work. Mm -hmm. um, and that also comes from the, the fact that we're one of the few places that offer a training program that allows you to get both pediatrics and child psychiatry together. And so that um, I'm really lucky to have trained here to do that where I can be board certified in both. And so I don't have to bring in an extra person in the room or send them to someone else to do that. We can do that all together. Phenomenal. That, I mean, that really is um, a, a, a com a real distinction for both the reputation and expertise of what Pittsburgh should be proud of in offering its community, um, its, its individuals, both young and adult, um, and then to see innovation uh, to approach these issues and overcome these problems in a way that others might not have um, been able to, and philanthropy making it possible that we can say, look, let us experiment, let us figure out how to do this, we'll make it more efficient, we'll show the, the benefits for families and, and in care, and we can show that it can be scalable and sustainable over time. So um, maybe you could talk for a minute about the referral process. So Chelsea, you talked at the beginning um, or earlier in the program that there have been 38 patients overall that have come through the program and we know that there's a scaling up to 50 and then to 250, but how about the referrals um, for these families that um, are able to enroll their child in the clinic? How does that happen? So right now, um, during our, our prototype phase, um, we are just getting referrals primarily from uh, general academic pediatrics in Oakland. Uh, so referrals are coming directly from a child's current pediatrician. Uh, the pediatrician um, fills out uh, essentially a referral form that is sent to the four of us, um, just answering some basic questions um, so we get a little bit of a snapshot of what's going on with the child and why the pediatrician is referring them to us. We as a team, the four of us, meet and discuss each referral, uh, looking at some of our criteria, uh, our acceptance criteria, and to discuss, you know, would this family be a good fit for a whole child? Mm -hmm. We then communicate back to the pediatrician if the child and family are accepted or not. Uh, if they are not, we also provide the pediatrician with other resources for the family. And if they are accepted, um, either Nafisa or Abby reach out to the family directly to introduce them to the clinic and to get them scheduled. That's great. Well, it's really important that we're not creating redundancy in services that are out there, being very clear about the the gap that um, this clinic is addressing in, in the care uh, model. And um, to be sure during this early phase of the pilot program, when all of the resources that we have are still on the limited side, that we're really addressing the, the children that can most benefit from this model. So um, thanks for explaining that to us. I see that we have another question from our audience. Um, does the team have any plans in place to support adolescent patients as they transition into adult care? So um, I can imagine that, you know, while the pilot phase is focused on more of a, of a younger and preteen age group, the benefits for the teenage population and ultimately how they then transition into adult care could be very concerning for parents who are experiencing that right now in their lives. So maybe you can talk to us about that. Sure, I, I, you know, I think that it's really important to recognize that, that like you said, that journey that happens. Um, though we primarily work with three to 12 right now, recognizing that that's not where the end is in terms of um, behavioral health needs. Oftentimes many of these, of these needs can be chronic and so making sure there's good continued support is really important. Um, and I think one of the things and another advantage of doing this here in Pittsburgh is we do have a lot of great behavioral health services. Um, and so our hope is the fact that we can really target early, work on doing strong, that developmental stage where it's so important to have strong supports, that we can have that in place to really find what's the next best model to keep working towards getting that adolescent and family towards that movement to adulthood. And, um, and ensuring that 
no matter where it is, that there is a good handoff that happens and making sure that they have that support to continue. So, you know, right now, again, we stay through to 12. We, we don't really say that right when someone turns 13, then we move them along. It's also, what does that family need and do they need to keep working for, for us with this level of support for a period longer? Um, and, you know, I think this is something we'll keep learning and understanding is there um, hopefully information we can provide to our clinics that work with adolescents to see if there's other supports that might be needed there as well that we can pass along. That's great. Um, and to all of you, another question that's come in, can you speak to the importance that philanthropy has on your work? Um, and as I mentioned at the beginning, um, you know, with 100% of the, the ability of this clinic to exist, depending on philanthropy, I want to recognize that we have a number of our um, individuals and, and organizations represented in the audience who have been supporting this program. Uh, top of mind, the Pittsburgh Penguins Foundation, the PNC Foundation, the Highmark Foundation, and lots of individuals, um, but a big shout out to Dave and Vanessa Morehouse who have not only personally supported the program, they've been champions of this program from the beginning. Um, so we, we know that some of uh, the positions are funded by philanthropy, but if you can talk a little bit more about what that means, um, I think our audience would appreciate it. Yeah, I, like you said, the positions being one of the big ones, if, if not for philanthropy, um, there'd only be two of us on this stage right now because really being able to cover a family support partner, being able to cover a nurse coordinator is not generally covered by insurance. Mm -hmm. um, those are more specialty programs that have really required philanthropy or working to get certain types of grants that are very hard to find to be able to allow that to happen. So already we know that we would not have the clinic we have today without that. Um, the other part is that we, whenever we do an evaluation, insurance companies have sometimes difficulty distinguishing between the psychiatrist role, the psychologist role. So we really have to make sure that we can show that, um, that we can do those together, the importance of doing those together, is, and oftentimes it would not be covered to be able to do that together. And so being able to have that really one time, that first time evaluation, everything together, can only happen at this point with philanthropy. Wow. It's been wonderful to see what we've been able to build so far, um, to see all the amazing work that's been accomplished, the great successes you've shared with us, uh, understanding how the clinic progresses, and, um, and that we hope in the future, it means that we are able to offer this resource to families in a sustainable way, and it can be scaled, and it can be available um, with communities all across the country trying to, to model something very similar and make the difference that you all have been making in these families' lives. I want to thank our audience again for joining us today. We've, we've come to uh, the end of our program and have, uh, have enjoyed having you with us to learn a lot more about our whole child wellness clinic. Again, thank you to everyone who has supported this program to make it possible. And know that uh, you know we continue to need support. Um, we have a lot more time, families, and work to 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 um, accomplish over the next couple of months and into the next year. So please continue to to support this amazing work. If you do have an interest, I invite you to reach out to my colleague Karen Deverman, and her contact information is on your screen. And know that we will be sending to you an email in the coming days that will share a link of today's program. We encourage you again, send it out to your friends and your family. Let them know that this program is uh, underway, the difference it's making, and, um, and engage others in uh, learning more about what we're doing at UPMC Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh and, um, and through the whole Child Wellness Clinic. Thank you so much.